We covered a little bit of what was happening with BRICS yesterday. We want to dive a little bit deeper with a person that I think has a little bit more information on this whole area of where BRICS is going and how the impact could be on not only crypto, but also the rest of the market. So we'll break it down for you. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into TechPath. I want to thank our sponsor today, and that is iTrust Capital. This is a place where you can hold crypto, special uh, uh, precious metals, gold and silver, all that for your own IRA. And it's very easy to get started. Just use the link down below. That will get you started. You get a $100 funding reward if you decide to go in that direction. Joining me today is Andy Sheckman, who is the president and owner of Miles Franklin. Uh, great to have you on the show, Andy. How are you? It's great to be here, Paul. I, I appreciate it. I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent. Well, I want to learn a little bit more of what... I've, I've had a chance to watch some of your interviews on BRICS, your analysis of what BRICS is in the middle of right now. And for some of our audience... They might be new to what's happening within it. Give us a rundown of what's happening right now at the BRICS Summit, because there seems to be some pretty key things going on. What's going on at the BRICS Summit is kind of being held close to the vest, but I would say there are a couple of things that are sticking out to me. Um, you know, everyone is talking about Project Embridge, and, and certainly that is being discussed, and I'm sure we'll chat about that. But there are a couple things that I think from a marketing standpoint, I guess you could say. It's as if they're trying to market certain information to the West. And to me, what they're trying to market to the West, they're kind of outwardly showing that they have their you-know-what together, that they're they're joined together in unity. And and I say that we've seen, for example, the discussion of Xi Jinping and, and Modi today are meeting on the sideline for their first bilateral meeting since 2022. That's one thing. I think they're trying to show the world that, look, we, we are putting our differences aside as a group, uh, and, and that gives stability. Certainly, that's something encouraging from the standpoint of growing unity uh, and a growing group of countries. Uh, secondly, we talk about BRICS pay. Uh, BRICS pay is something that is is more for the, the individual, whereas Embridge is more for the countries trading in, in commodities, as an example, and settling in what amounts to a gold-backed settlement currency. But the BRICS pay would be more like, let's call it a monetary passport, to use Vince Lancey's terminology. I agree with that. It's, it's these uh, people from want to go uh, in, into one of the other BRICS countries, and they're able to use their BRICS pay app, whether it be a credit card or on their phone, that allows them to seamlessly transact in these countries without having to convert first and foremost and and all of the difficulty in doing so uh, in, in, in countries where it might be difficult to exchange your currency very efficiently. So they're, they're getting all their ducks in a row all the way down to settling um, retail transactions with public. And I think this is one of the deals where we have to understand that I don't expect anything to come out of this meeting groundbreaking, yet it is a trend that is certainly gaining um, an accelerated, um, coordinated um, group of countries that, that are moving in the direction, I guess you could say, critical mass, a direction that will be very difficult to challenge, as is, Paul. They already represent a much larger swath of human population, of right. global GDP, of military might, three of the four largest nuclear arsenals, of trade routes, of, of, of commodity production, uh, of commodity refining. Uh, it, it's a situation that uh, is certainly should not be underestimated. And it will be interesting when they come out with some sort of a recap, probably on Friday, of what indeed did transpire. Uh, we do know that there's at least 30 countries there that have already expressed interest or delegates from 13 countries that have expressed interest in joining or have fully applied on top of the other countries that are already full members. So uh, it, it's an interesting growing trend that uh, I don't think uh, we've even begun to see what it really amounts to. We covered quite a bit of uh, of some of the alignment there on screen. You guys are seeing, you know, you mentioned BRICS Pay. Uh, their paid P2B program, uh, the unit, which I want to get into in a second, that that's still in in discussion. Uh, they also have a BRICS loyalty model, which is going to be around traveler reward system. So again, more of the monetary system, but and then BRICS Clear, which is a settlement system for cross border security settlement. So you look at the unit uh, potential token right now. They they raised a thousand Bitcoin for rollout uh, to essentially kind of seed this. First of all, why do you think they used Bitcoin here and not necessarily maybe tokenized gold or something of that nature? Uh, you know, that's a good question, to be honest with you. 
in in principle, they've agreed to the unit being backed 40% by gold. But there are going to be, when it's all said and done, other items added to this basket. Uh, I'm sure Bitcoin is on their on their uh, on their right. whiteboard as as one of those potential items. As far as I know, at this point, though, it is not a part of the unit in terms of its settlement structure. When you look at the unit token, is this going to be something that is available to the public through some sort of DEX or exchange or? a location in which we'd be able to trade within the unit token itself, much like you do with currencies? Perhaps over time, but not at first. Uh, and that's where BRICS Pay comes into play. Uh, to my understanding, the unit token will be for uh, central banks, commercial banks, settling <clears throat> transactions uh, primarily in, in energy. Uh, but mm-hmm. the whole premise of Embridge, first and foremost, <clears throat> is for countries to trade their central bank digital currencies local trade with one another over a system that is not affected by SWIFT. And what this will do is incentivize these countries to keep their monetary homes and houses in order. Uh, The unit token itself says not more than 30% of any one currency will comprise the basket. So they've, they've taken some of these things into consideration in terms of dominance. And the actual unit token itself is a fractal of the entire unit holding. So as things have to be adjusted primarily in the currencies. See, everything is, is a, a percentage as it relates to gold, and it's, it's tied to gold. So as things have to be readjusted, it doesn't have to, they don't have to be readjusted on the actual tokens themselves because the tokens represent a fractal of the entire unit will just automatically adjust. But as far as I've been told, no, at first, although it may be after, uh, this will be a, a system that is designed primarily for, for the state and not for the individual. So what do you think the market cap is going to be comprised of between those 30 countries? Would it be similar to a percentage of the overall GDP? You know, I don't know. I mean, they haven't, they have, they've been very tight-lipped about it. I mean, the unit has been something that has been discussed mostly in theory, and they have been tight-lipped as to how it actually rolls out. But you know, look, I mean, I think it, it has to do with how much gold do you have, first and foremost. Yeah. And if you look at all of the countries that have been buying gold and repatriating it, the key to it, as you said, is that it is held within the borders of the countries that are producing the unit token. And this is, is good, obviously, for the counterparty risk element when we look at the weaponizing of the Treasury. Um, but I think when you talk about market cap, it's something that will continue to expand the tethering, if you will, to, to a percentage of gold that will enable it to not be inflated away the way that the Western currencies have. When you look at the United States, we're creating $100,000 of debt per second right now, 24-7, yeah. a trillion every 90 days. That's something that won't happen with the unit token. And as far as the market cap, I guess I would say I don't know, but I would expect it to continue to expand. You look at the GDP size of that. What percentage do you think the unit token would be comprised of for each, let's just look at the total GDP of those 30 nations. Do you think it would be 10%, 25% as they start to divest or however much they can get in terms of uh, gold assets they can bring in? So it'd be different for each country. Well, uh, so I think it's an expanding deal where it starts out a smaller percentage of GDP, but by the end, I think it would comprise a much larger percentage if indeed this takes hold and and is seen as something very legitimate that is actually actually challenging settlement for energy across the globe um, with all of these BRICS countries. When you look at Western rails, because it's not like the U.S. dollar is going to just uh, eliminate overnight, but it could move quickly to where we see de-dollarization happen. But Western rails are still going to be a huge part of the global economy. How would BRICS be able to on board into the Western rails, if they're going through something like an embridge, which essentially is, um, de- you know, kind of destabilizing the idea of SWIFT. So I understand why they're doing that, but they're still going to have to do U- trade with the U.S. and Canada and Europe, uh, Italy, you know, the U.K., etc. What would be the route they would take? You also have um, the Bank of International Settlements standing behind it. And this is something that lends, I think, credibility to the question, to the way that you phrased it, this is a Western entity as well. And, you know, you're, you're seeing, I think the realization and and even you'll, if you dig deep, you'll see like names like JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs who want to take part in this as well. 
whether it be through something like Project Agora, which is the Western answer to this, um, mm-hmm. they make a very, very strong point of saying that the uh, while the U.S. dollar and the SWIFT system at this point is not compatible with Enbridge, they talk about the fact that it has tremendous adaptability, that systems should be able to integrate with uh, the Enbridge. But you'll have banks and companies that I think will adapt that will allow for access to it, at least at the beginning. And when you see the Bank of International Settlements as part of this, it becomes fairly obvious that the West has a a kind of their nose under the tent, if you will, and should have some form of, uh, uh, of connectivity with with Enbridge as it begins to uh, to grow and, and take hold. I've got a clip here that kind of goes into that test that's being done uh, by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, let me go ahead and play this clip for you and we'll get your opinion. Take a look. What, can you walk us through your work in those two projects to date and what the U.S. has you know, really been looking at from the Federal Reserve Bank point of view? Uh, primarily, we have a strategic partnership with the Bank for International Settlements uh, Innovation Hub. And the practical work that we're doing, and you referenced two of our current projects, Agora and the Regulated Settlement Network, uh, those are two that are currently underway. And uh, there was a phase two of Project CEDAR that we conducted in collaboration with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, which focused more on interoperability. Uh, we then worked on a project called the Regulated Liability Network, or RLN, uh, which added additional assets um, to different use cases that we were focused on, and also added uh, complexity uh, around uh, cross-border and payments-oriented use cases that we believe are, are high-value use cases uh, to focus on. Um, RSN has expanded the focus on different sorts of digital assets uh, that might benefit from uh, tokenization. Uh, it's also added uh, complexity uh, relative um, to the interoperability problem uh, that exists that we're trying to understand how we might solve for that. We're working with six other central banks and 41 private sector organizations in that project. And one thing that I would emphasize is that all of our, our work is focused just on research and experimentation. Um, so we're not building production systems uh, with the work that we're doing, but we're conducting research that ideally might inform uh, what production systems, uh, if they come to market, uh, might contain. Uh, some of the key areas that I referenced earlier uh, that we believe are, are critical to understand uh, relative to the progression of tokenization I include um, interoperability. If we can't figure that out, this isn't going to work. Uh, that's also based on a hypothesis that we have uh, that uh, the future will really be heterogeneous. Uh, there won't be one ledger to rule them all. There won't be a single system uh, that ultimately provides uh, products and services within a tokenized domain uh, to the financial system. Uh, but there'll be different ledgers. Uh, there'll be different infrastructures that are available um, to different uh, consumers, uh, different um, Uh, industry actors, different banks that are specific to the use cases uh, that they're focused on. No, what they're referencing there was like what you were talking about is Project Agora. This is the the list of private sector institutions that are involved in this. So quite a few. I mean, this is a lot of uh, pretty high powered uh, infrastructure out there. JP Morgan in there, even Swift and MasterCard. There's quite a bit here. They are talking about a interoperable uh, we, we, of course, on our show love to hear that word because it means multi-chain. And the likelihood of us seeing maybe a variety of uh, blockchains or other entities and digital assets being used to kind of help support this. So that being a, a big part of this, you look at public blockchains versus the private blockchain of what Embridge is doing, because that's obviously BRICS versus what would happen over here maybe in the Western world. Do you think there's going to be any ramifications between those two? I have a hard time believing that that the Federal Reserve or the BIS would would integrate systems that are decentralized into what amounts to a a centralized ecosystem. You know, this is one of the reasons why a lot of people talk about XRP uh, because yes. XRP truly isn't decentralized, and they have the ability to you know reach out and grab someone if they have to so to speak, in a crude sense of, of the word. But uh, I do think that you will see a lot of these these systems attempt to be integrated. And all the, and all the, the names on that list are, are you know, that would, would pay reference to that. When you see all of these countries involved in, in Enbridge and all of, these, excuse me, all of these institutions involved in Enbridge, Western-based institutions, there's no question there will be inter- interoperability. The question is, what, what systems will they integrate? And 
I'm, I'm surprised that, that Bitcoin is on the list. I don't think it will be something that will be tied to any settlement, but I do think they understand the ability of transacting currencies and being able to purchase things like Bitcoin, I would see, quite frankly, a much higher possibility of something like XRP being involved in 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 transacting, in, in right. being used to integrate with uh, uh, the the M Bridge or or Project Agora or any of these other uh, settlement options, a uh, form of instant settlement, a much more efficient way of doing so, but all of it under the purview, if you will, of the BIS and of the Western system. So it's an interesting thought experiment. Don't know how it all plays out, but so many people focus on the BRICS pushing away from Western hegemony. I think it's, it's, it's naive to not notice, uh, you know, the, the elephant in the corner of the room, and that is the BIS and all of the, the organizations who are signing up to participate in it as well. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Ripple because Ripple is doing some things within uh, the SBI, which is uh, using XRPL for supply chain solutions. So this is exactly what you're talking about, is this could be maybe one of the solutions that Project Agora and others might get into in terms of use case for not only value, but just the, the transactional layers of blockchain. But gold still has a major problem around audits. So you look at how they're using gold within the base of the unit token. I mean, auditing that versus just going on a blockchain and auditing a holding, quite a bit different because that's a physical audit inside places like Iran and Saudi Arabia and Russia, etc. Do you think that has any, uh, any potential problems? No, that's the pushback from a lot of people who who I respect, who are are more in the Bitcoin space, and and I I respect it. I understand it. The unit token says that these escrow accounts will be independently and continuously audited, mm -hmm. with stiff penalties for deviation from from the protocol and the ecosystem, with all of that information in real time on the blockchain for everyone to see. But yes. Uh, I think they're going to really have to put a lot of emphasis on the auditing process and to inspire that confidence. The fact that these tokens are deliverable upon request is also something that is, um, you know, that's something that should mitigate the the um, uh, desire, if you will, to to cheat on the auditing process. But yeah, yeah you know, I, I I think that is from a hundred mile high perspective, it is one of the issues that must be addressed. But I think anything is better at this point. Look, if you realize that every central bank on the planet owns gold, you can't say that about about Bitcoin. And um, I just I just think that that these countries realize that gold is wealth and to tie the system to gold have it audited uh, continuously independently is a far better solution than what we currently have. I don't know why they've chosen to do it this way, but I think it's much better that each country has the ability to hold it themselves rather than sending it to one central authority like we've seen literally for almost 100 years with everyone sending their gold to the LBMA or to the Bank of England yeah. uh, to have access to the LBMA and to the New York Fed to have access on COMEX. And we've seen over 40 countries repatriate their gold, one of which was Venezuela. And the Bank of England said, no, we're not going to give it back to you. So, yes, I, I get your point, but let's hope that they've taken that into consideration for their own good to make sure that that auditing inspires confidence. Well, I think that will be the challenge. And you look at uh, some of the countries globally. I mean, this is a good example right here. This is U.S. government current holdings on Bitcoin and digital assets in general. Uh, likelihood is you've got Saudi Arabia owning a lot of Bitcoin. You've got Qatar talking about repositioning a lot of assets into Bitcoin. I mean, I think that we're dealing with the potential of a replacement of the fiat system. And it's likely that gold and Bitcoin and or digital assets are going to start to rise uh, in terms of the opportunity here. So it's not that we're pick, pitting one against the other. What we're trying to figure out is where is the trend going for these BRICS, of course, is leading part of that. But at the same time, we're starting to see movement in the Western countries around digital assets. So I think a lot of that is uh, playing into that. I was looking at the XRPL um, layout here. This is the, the BRICS pay wholesale CBDC. Ripple, of course, is involved in a lot of these areas, such as India, uh, Brazil, of course, we know about them. China already. 
um, and then you all the, all the way down into what's happening in South Africa. So they're they're in position right now to be a part of this. It'll be interesting to see how they plug in effectively into how, and of course, a lot of this is still going to be boiling down to what BRICS ends up saying. I know Putin is going to be, what is it, Thursday? Yeah, conference ends on Thursday, uh, and apparently Putin is going to be the one that kind of talks about what's what what they decided. So we'll hear, hopefully we'll hear some stuff that uh, will give us some insights to this for sure. If you were looking at the best crypto to play, and not, I know that obviously you're you're a gold guy, but you look at diversification. I think a lot of our and people that follow our channel, they might hold gold. They hold all sorts of assets, uh, crypto being one of them. But you look at some of the crypto opportunities out there, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, something like a Stellar or an XRP, uh, Chainlink, some of these that are starting to integrate with the banking system. Is there any that you would say, oh, this might be interesting to watch? I mean, I own a little bit of Bitcoin only because I didn't want to say, why didn't I own it? Um, and I've been talking about this stuff for so very long, but I am a hard asset guy to your point, And it, it, it's hard for me to let my mind go to a place where I can't hold it. Um, but I do, do really, really recognize the potential in XRP. Um, and, and in looking at the way that it's constructed in looking at the contracts that have already been signed and looking at that flow chart that you just showed, uh, it's unquestionable that once all this nonsense with the SEC is behind them, um, in my opinion, it offers amazing potential because it's going to be integrated into the system. It would be the one that yeah. I would probably say offers the best potential, at least from an expansion of the system that already is showing you that it is in many, in, in, in I guess in just about every sense of the word, is, is already integrated into their plans. I was looking at the gold chart here, um, Andy, and and one thing is if you look at the range between 1970 to around uh, 1980, well, gold took a massive run, uh, almost uh, almost 2,000 percent. Then we go into its next run, which was around uh, July of 2001, uh, to its high back in August of uh, 2011. Uh, about uh, 638 percent. The next run was about 93 percent, and we're currently in a run of about 69 percent. Where does gold stop? Or I mean, at, at its current high right now, trading today as we film this, 2,717 dollars, and it's on a 63 percent two-year run right now. Now, granted, that's a smaller percentage each time of these bull runs, so to speak, of gold. But is there a top or, a, or an area that you would say a price target for gold in the next, say, 12 months? Within the next 12 months, it, it, it becomes easier to follow this, the commercial bank um, verbiage and, and pr projections of 3100 by you know this time next year, which I think mm. is, is conservative. The money supply has increased 14-fold since, um, since 1980. And when you look at the gold and silver and the way that it's traded currently in London and on the COMEX, I think these countries are using the suppression of the paper markets to their advantage to, to accumulate it in copious amounts. The reason they're not complaining about the massive leverage on the LBMA where you know twice uh, global uh, mine supply is traded every single day in silver, it, it's uh, three and a half times annual global mm. mine supply every day. Most of these contracts are naked short. These, these, this suppression has been done for a very long time to inspire confidence in the Western system, the bond market and, and the currency, and they've held down the monetary metals. And it's unquestionable when you dig deep into the naked short positions on both the LBMA and COMEX that, that this is the case. And the rest of these countries have been using that suppression against us by massively accumulating it and repatriating it. And, you know, I guess I keep coming back to the fact that I truly do believe that they all have intentions of revaluing gold ultimately to if you're going to tie gold to a system, whether it only be 40 percent or more, it you're has right. to be at a much higher level. And, you know, ironically, in every single central bank balance sheet across the globe, gold is held in what is called the gold revaluation account. Roosevelt did it in 33 when he confiscated gold and then devalued the dollar by 
forty percent, pushing the gold price from twenty to thirty five. And you have, like I said, the head of the Dutch National Bank who keeps saying, look, we have 20 billion in euro and gold at $35 an ounce. We should just revalue the price of gold uh, and, and put it up to a level commensurate to offset our liabilities. Kristalina Georgieva says if a CBDC is not pegged to something, it's fiat. When you realize that if you take the world's GDP and the countries that comprise 99% of it, they all have CBDCs in operation or development. When you realize the BIS reclassified gold is the world's only other tier one reserve asset, all the countries are buying it. You're hearing pegging behind it. And, and I, I, I look to Cynthia Loomis at the Bitcoin conference in Tennessee where she said, look, you know, after Trump got up and said we should have a strategic account with Bitcoin, she said, yes, and I'm going uh, to draft a bill that requests that the gold held by the Federal Reserve on behalf of uh, the Treasury be revalued. Now, every $4,000 increase in the price of gold gives a, a trillion dollars free and clear to the Treasury General account. And right. Janet wouldn't even need um, to get a, a, a vote of Congress, just instruct Jerome Powell to do this. Now, I know it sounds crazy, but to me, it really isn't. It's much easier path than outright default or outright hyperinflation to revalue the gold. And look, as nuts as this sounds, but it really isn't. It shouldn't be from your camp because, you know, when you talk about Bitcoin, people have no problem seeing it at 150000 or 300000 or a million. Why could gold not be at $135,000? If it were, as insane as that sounds, our debt, our, our balance sheet would go from putrid to pristine just like that, and our assets would offset our liabilities. This is something that I think is possible. Now, on a microcosm scale, you see the Shanghai Metals Exchange has been pricing silver between 10 and 15 percent higher than it is on the West. Yeah. Uh, that is what the price is if you're able to buy it in the West and deliver it to China. If the Treasury said, look, we'll pay $135,000 to any nation that wants to deliver their gold to the Treasury, it indeed is that price. Now, are they going to do it to that level? Probably not. But when you see gold going to 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 as a revaluation on behalf of the, the Western central banks and the BIS that reclassified it as the only other tier one asset, I will tell you that I do believe if it is going to be the cornerstone of this new monetary system, and it looks like it will be, at least as far as the unit, as far as the BIS, and not so sure yet here in the West, but when you see a senator from Wyoming say that, to me, it's on the table. And uh, I think it will go higher than anyone thinks possible. But you don't buy it for that reason. You buy it because it is wealth. And the central banks know the playbook. They're the most well-informed traders in the world. The fact that they're buying at the levels they are and repatriating it the way that they are tells you that something is in store for a new system tied to gold. And I do believe it will be a marriage of blockchain technology and gold, but it will have to be at higher levels. So in a year, over 3000 for sure. I think you'll see it over 3000 maybe even by the end of this year. Mm. But ultimately, higher than people think possible in the face of a system that is just very long in the tooth that needs to be changed. And the only way to do it is to inspire confidence. And what better way to do it than with gold tied to blockchain technology? And if you do it at 40% at a really elevated level, you still give the politicians some monetary latitude. Um, but not enough to just create as we are right now. Yeah, runaway inflation. Debt per yeah. second. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. You know, obviously digital assets would most likely be the under the overarching asset behind underarching, much like USDC or Tether is now, trying to tie it to a fiat dollar and or securities. That could all shift again with uh, with stable coins of how that is, is valued. So listen, Andy, it's going to get very... Yeah, it's going to get very interesting, I think, in the next 12 months as BRICS continues to force the hand, I think, here of Western countries, uh, especially around uh, what we're dealing with on the national debt side. We definitely want to have you back on because I want to dive into the amount of liquidity that is sitting on the sidelines in things like money market funds, the stabilization of banks, and what that looks like. So I'd love, I know that's another conversation, but we'll definitely uh, try to get you back in. Uh, to cover that as well. Yeah, count me interested. I'd love to come okay. back on any time, Paul. And, cool. And thanks for having me, buddy. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Andy. And uh, for anybody, we'll leave a link uh, where you can find Andy and Miles Franklin. And thanks for stopping in. We appreciate it.
Thanks, Paul. Take care. All right. You guys, if you're uh, listening, if you're dialed in to our channel, make sure and subscribe. And of course, get into the Diamond Circle. It's our own private group where we do additional podcasts, more content out there, more research for you guys. And of course, you can follow me on X at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath. 